So hey everyone, uh, today we have an interview with John and Kelly Tone Tai. Uh, did I say that right? Did I, what did yeah, I nailed it. Okay, awesome. I'm usually really bad with names. So uh, I met John on Dental Town, one of the like, pretty much the largest community of dentists in North America um, and actually US and Canada. And John has a really great reputation there. He's helped a lot of dental practices improve operations, improve efficiency. So he comes highly recommended from actual dentists. Um, so I want to chat with John today about, you know, all the things that we're seeing with our clients and dental practices in general, operational issues, staff issues, like how to improve, um, you know, how to improve your practice. So you, you know, you, you see growth. A lot of clients come to us to do marketing. You know, they think that if they just do a bit of social media or some SEO, it's going to fix everything in their company. But we see, uh, you know, like if you lift that curtain and really look at what's going on with most practices, it's not marketing that they're really missing. It's actually these internal sort of improvements and operational issues that for most dentists, they kind of just go unnoticed. They don't even realize they're having these problems until, you know, we bring them to the surface. Uh, so I want to welcome John and Kelly today, and we're going to chat about these operational type of issues. And I think a lot of dentists are going to get quite a bit of value out of it, especially if they think that marketing is going to be the the reason you know the, the like the, the why they're going to go from a million to two million dollars in production it's usually not it's usually a lot of the stuff that john and his team kind of handles okay so john um you know one of the things we see all the time is dentists come to us and they want to do seo they want to do social media they want to build a new website and they think you know in order to improve patient flow, you know, that's what's required. Um, but most of the time what happens is, you know, the reason a practice is doing maybe a million dollars of production and not $2 million isn't because they haven't found the right marketing company or the right SEO. Most of the time, the issues are actually internal because when we talk to them and we ask them, you know, well, how many patients are actually calling you? Like, how many do you actually book? How many people called you about Invisalign in the last couple of months? Usually, you know, nine out of 10 uh, cases, the answer is, I don't know. And once we start measuring these things, you start to realize like, that's actually where a lot of the problems lie. There's a lot of good opportunities that slip through the cracks every day. Uh, there are phone calls that, you know, are missed during business, uh, business hours, staff that forget to follow up with, with prospective patients. So most of the time, uh, once they start improving things internally, that's really when they start to grow their revenue. If you have a uh, practice that runs like a well-oiled machine at that stage just about any kind of marketing you do is, is going to be very very effective but if you have a business that has internal issues you know you can hire the best marketing company on the planet you're not really going to see a huge amount of growth so in your experience are you seeing the same thing if you have the same experience with dental practices uh, and if so sort of like tell us about the sort of issues that you're seeing internally and, and how you help them with that well uh you know, this exact issue that we're talking about is really the reason that 406 Resources uh, even formed. Um, you know, myself, I've got, gosh, at this point, over 15 years uh, of marketing experience uh, that I've done for medical practices in general, as well as dentistry. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you, you drop an ad and your campaign's rocking and rolling, the phone's ringing. Um, but then again, some of these same issues you know, they, the phone would ring and then, but they don't see the jump in new patients or yes. getting the results that they're really after. Um, and so obviously, you know, the dentist or the doctor, you know, they didn't go to school to, to run the business. So they don't really necessarily always have the best grip on what's going on at the front desk. Yeah. And so as you found a lot of times in recording the phone calls, you find that, you know, phones aren't getting answered, calls aren't returned. Uh, or the person's like super busy, so they want to put them on hold. They want to yep. hold them and hang up. I mean, all these disastrous things that, that uh, you know, can happen with a phone call. Yeah. And so, you know, started talking to the front desk more and um, kind of started seeing a bit of a pattern. Well, Kelly starts working for a dentist here locally and quickly becomes the office manager there. And the dentist finds out what I do for a living. And says, "Hey, I would love for you to come in and and you know do this for us." Mm -hmm. And so I started doing it and kind of started running into some of the same issues. But the difference is, Kelly and I could have a discussion and say, "Okay, I'm putting in. We're doing some TV ads today, and we're going to run today. We're going to run tomorrow. 
uh, you know, check the phones, let me know how things are going, how are people reacting, what kind of patients are you talking to? And um, we were able to have these candid discussions over the next several months. If we put a new commercial um, and she knew that we were running on certain days, hey, the phones are just not ringing, switch up the commercial. Mm-hmm. And, uh, or this type of, you know, person is calling, what kind of commercial are we running right now? Mm-hmm. And so we would make changes um, and the difference between, you know, working as a marketing agency, talking to a front desk person is that we could have these candid conversations. She's not afraid to hurt my feelings, obviously. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, I'm also not afraid to, to, to you know, make my point as well. Yeah. Uh, but we're both fighting for the same person. You know, our goal was to elevate the practice to that next level. And because we're both working for the same person, we're both working in the same direction. um, It really kind of started to link together more and more as I learned about their systems uh, and they learned more about what I do and what, you know, whom I was after as a potential new patient. um, We started to see things really start to trend up. And it got to where I was asking more questions of Kelly about other practices for other doctors to kind of get some of those behind the curtain answers. And that's what we were like, wow, we should do this as a company. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so it's, it's really kind of taken off from that point. So as far as dealing with the front desk and the systems that are in place, I mean, obviously that's where Kelly comes in. And um, so the, the, the phone rings and when she answers, you know, she knows what to do with it. And to, and to back up, I mean, before, you know, I worked in the practice before um, John stepped in for the marketing component. So that practice um, was one of the top, you know, producers, you know, nationally recognized. And they used one particular advertising company. Um, I think they were in Colorado and everyone used them. Everyone used them. And, you know, answering the phone and realizing that the way that that company was placing ads, you know, I could hear people's court in the background when patients uh-huh. would call. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, it, 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 <laughs> they, they were placing ads in a way that's non-relevant um, to how John handled marketing. You know, he wasn't, right. he wasn't shooting for, for the same clientele. And Mm -hmm. so I would come home and I would be super frustrated. Like everyone who's on government assistance is calling our office and we are a service practice, you know, like it's a disservice to them and it's a disservice to us. You know, we're having to tread through a million phone calls that are not relevant. This is not our market. This is not our target practice. Yeah, Um, but it looks impressive when it's like, look how many phone calls we got you. It's like, but nobody asks, like, are any of these actually good patients, right? Because in my opinion, it's it's much better to get, you know, 10, 15, 20 patients a month that, you know, they value dentistry, they're willing to pay for it, you know, they, they don't think every dentist is the same, and they're just calling the cheapest one. Uh, these patients typically will stay longer, right? So I, I think it's hard to build a high quality business if your entire marketing strategy is to go after low quality customers, right? Right. The yeah. people who are home during the day and who aren't working, yeah. you know? So it was, it was, it was eye opening, I think both ways, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it was very easy to tell when patients called what their questions were with the old marketing firm. Um, it was very easy to tell that, you know, they maybe got too big, too fast, and maybe mm-hmm. they didn't change their strategy and they just kept trying to duplicate the same thing. And yes, I'm sure their numbers were substantiated. We had this many phone calls, but I can book patients all day long. And when they show up to my practice and can't pay anything, you know, yeah. and I'm not a government assistance practice, you know, it, it, it was eye opening, I think, in both ways. So I think it's important to have somebody at the front desk who has that marketing mindset, mm-hmm. um, you know, who who can can kind of see um, in both directions. Like John yeah, said. you guys mentioned something interesting. It's, you know, the practices, uh, I think there's a couple of things why you see a lot of practices have operational issues. So first of all, you know, John touched upon it. It's like they didn't go to dental school to run a business, right? It's not that they, they can't or they're not intelligent enough to do it. I mean, if you're smart enough to get into medical school, 
you could have gone to, to an Ivy League business school if you wanted to, right? But most of them don't want to look at spreadsheets all day or look at numbers. Like that's not what is exciting for them. You know, they want to work with patients. They, they're, you know, they, they love the sciences. Um, the other issue that I see is that for the practice to make money, the dentist has to be in the operatory every day. It doesn't right. really leave a lot of room to kind of run a company and look at stats. So it's important to have somebody at the front that's a bit more business minded and can look at the big picture that like, yes, you did get a hundred phone calls, but if we really look at how many people actually booked and how good are these patients? Like, are these the types of patients that are going to stick with us for five, 10 years, or are they going to jump ship the moment somebody else offers a better coupon down the street? Right. right. So these are usually questions like uh, business issues that, most practices are not aware of they don't really tackle um so do you guys deal with like if, if somebody has like what one thing i've noticed is sometimes the office manager in the practice um you know is young and they don't have a lot of experience with the stuff it might be the first or practice they've ever worked at so they don't have the sort of business knowledge like do you guys work with their staff to train them on like here's what to look for like besides just booking the appointment how to filter out the right patients like how to look at uh, sort of these big picture issues yeah so the way that it, and there's a lot to unpack uh, yeah. when it comes to that because like you said it goes well beyond making the phone ring yes. um, so first of all um, the doc has to basically make the office manager a partner in everything marketing you have to be fully involved. You got to tell them, hey, we're going to be running an advertising campaign. It's going to start on this day. It's going to start Monday the 1st. And we anticipate, you know, the phones to ring or you're going to get more messaging from Facebook or emails. And, you know, you need to let them know what you're advertising. If you're advertising for sedation dentistry or if you're advertising for implants or ortho and the front desk needs to know what's going on. And after that, but they also need to understand that you've got to answer the phone quick. Don't put people on hold, you know, book the appointment, get all the necessary information. Um, and of course, do all of that in a very cheerful and welcoming manner. Make that yeah. person feel like they're the most important person you've talked to all day. And then once they come in, the job still isn't finished because they've got to say yes to treatment, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so then there needs to be a good system in place in order for you know the marketing to really run full circle um because yeah, they're, yeah. they're still not a patient yet because haven't they haven't had any work done um so the front desk has to welcome that patient they've got to uh make them feel super special like they're the only person in the building when they get a tour of the office let's say mm -hmm. uh you know they have one person by their side all you know the entire uh visit and all the handoffs have got to be you know, just seamless between front desk to the assistant, to the hygienist, to the doctor, to the treatment coordinator. And, you know, hopefully they will say yes to any necessary treatment they may be in for. And, you know, that, you know, patient experience is something that that dentists uh, really zone in on. And it's all yeah. started yeah. because of the advertising or the marketing. And that patient was treated a certain way from A to Z in their patient experience. Uh, yeah, so, so you, you mentioned something like you're right in that there's sometimes this disconnect where there's a marketing company they hire and they're doing their own things in their own little silo. And there might be a few because sometimes they hire social media company, SEO company, you know, like uh, some dentists work with, with more than one vendor. They're not really necessarily talking to the staff. The staff's not really even talking internally where, you know, like when there's a handoff from uh, the patient from the receptionist to the treatment coordinator or the dentist, um, you know, that's it's, it's not a nice, clean handoff. Sometimes it's just uh, I've heard numerous phone calls where the patient calls, begins to explain their problem. The person says, OK, please hold. They transfer them to somebody else, not even explaining that they're transferring them. The next person says, how can I help you? They have to explain the the thing all over again. Right. The second person thinks, oh, this isn't really my area. Hold on. Let me put you on hold. They send them back to the first person. And it's like, what the heck is going on here? Right? Like, yeah. what a disaster, right? So, um, you know, is this because the staff are overwhelmed? Like, one thing I noticed, what I've seen a lot of practices is it's tough to work at the front desk. 
Yeah. The phone is ringing. You need to check out a patient. There's a dentist pushing some chart or something you got to do in your face, you know, get it done right now. Like they're, they're trying to do a good job. It's just, just so much chaos, right? Uh, in, in day-to-day operations. So how do you deal with that? Like, is this, you just need more people or is it a systems problem where, you know, people don't know how to work together? Like, how do you, how do you fix that in a practice? I think it's definitely a systems issue. Okay. Um, I think as practices grow, they need more people. And I think as you become more successful, you need those people to specialize. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem at the front desk is you hire multitaskers. And you have to because there's so many tasks going on at one time. But the problem with that is we all know multitasking can be great um, when you're trying to cook dinner. But when you're trying to run a business, it may not yeah. be great because your attention isn't, you know, completely, you know, focused on one on one task. Um, so we definitely push systems. We teach systems. We push systems. You know, a simple tweak um, and listening to a new patient phone call. A lot of a lot of very successful practices are going to kind of a, a two new patient system where we've identified that this call is good. So this call is going to be in a priority column on our schedule for an hour and a half. We've identified this call called during people's court. And so they're going to be 30 minutes. And we may ask for them to to give a credit card to reserve that appointment. Um, You know, so that way we're not bogging our practice down with unnecessary or, or, or unworthy um, patients, you know, we're, yeah. we're loading the best time to the best ones and the least time to the ones that may or may not pan out. Now, that experience is not going to be any different for the patient. It's just an internal system on how we identify mm-hmm. who should have priority and who doesn't. Um, you know, so we definitely push systems. We push just minor tweaks, you know, for example, having a front desk person control the phone call versus letting that person ask 72,000 questions when you're not the dentist. And yeah. you may make or break whether they come in or not with all this verbal vomit that you just spit out trying to prove to the patient how smart you are. Um, you know, so we want the front desk to control the conversation. We don't I want definitely see that problem. Yeah, that's a common yeah, thing. Definitely. And we don't want we don't want the patient to be able to ask question after question after question and the front desk just keep trying to prove I'm smart enough. Come here. Come here. Mm -hmm. When ultimately the treatment's going to be sold in the back. So, yeah, yeah. you know, that's one minor system. You could spend 20 minutes on a call with the patient who you let dominate the conversation and ask every question. Or you can spend five minutes on a call where you dominate the the conversation and then you're back to being able to multitask in a way that is much more efficient um, and fluid for your practices. Yeah, you you bring up a really excellent point. I think that, um, you know, it's that whole thing of like, don't grease the squeaky wheel because um, there are patients that will eat up a lot of your time and they're not necessarily the high value patients. So you will get calls. And I think probably, yeah, the key to making the thing run smoothly is having a criteria of like, what is a high value patient? What's an okay patient? What's a low value patient? And um, allocating the right amount of resources, right? Like if you have to spend 30 minutes to convince somebody to come in for a checkup and a cleaning, that means you're taking time away from the people that are very low, you know, like they're happy to come in. They're not going to waste a lot of your time, but then they, those, it's like the best customers get neglected because you're spending all your time trying to please the people that are unpleasable. And it, you know, when you're dealing with a million distractions, if you don't have a system to fall back on, that becomes like muscle memory it's easy to waste a lot of time every day and not accomplish anything, right? Like it's easy to be busy. It doesn't mean that you're actually productive or that you're pushing the needle. Right. Yeah. So one thing that has come up a lot is sometimes uh, this happens a lot with young dentists, they buy a practice and the nature of dental sales from what I've seen, you know, the staff don't know what the business is being sold right? They, they kind of keep it a secret so that the staff don't jump ship, you know? So uh, a dentist will look at the financials of a practice. It all looks great. Okay. They buy the business and then they show up one day and says, you know, I'm the new owner. And 
they end up kind of inheriting the staff, right? Because there isn't really a mechanism where they get to meet everybody that's running the business. You know, they just typically look at financial numbers and it looks good on paper, but they don't really know what are the people like that are running this business day to day. So they come in and they have huge ambitions. You know, I'm going to renovate everything. We're going to do things differently. We're going to start offering services we never did before or that the old dentist never did. And they have so much enthusiasm. And then they kind of like just like hit a brick wall where sometimes the staff is like, they're not uh, receptive to that. They don't want to change. Okay. They, I, I don't tell, can't tell you how many times I've heard, you know, well, Dr. Jones, you know, didn't, didn't used to do it this way. And it's like, okay, but you know, he spent 20 years running a practice that sold for less than a million dollars. Like he wasn't exactly a very successful dentist. Uh, that's not my future. So let's, let, we need to do something different. Um, and, you know, dentists, like, let's be honest, they're not necessarily the most people people out there, right? Uh, they're very logical, they're very calculated. And I see a lot of them struggle to kind of get the staff to change direction. Now, is this solvable? Uh, you know, can you get people on the, on the same page? Do you have to fire some of the staff and hire new people? Or is it the way that they're approaching it? If they're approaching it wrong and, you know, the, you know, it's getting the staff to put their backs up. How do you deal with this issue? Like I've never really, this is not my area of expertise, but I see this problem all the time with, with new practice owners. Right. And so obviously in the climate that we're in, we see it, you know, everywhere is that uh, people are having a hard time retaining staff and yeah. lose somebody. now you've got a nightmare of a time finding somebody to replace. Um, but obviously, you know, you want to have people working there that want to be there. Uh, so, I mean, honestly, Kelly's got a really interesting take, uh, I think, on that because, um, you know, we have had to, to deal with that in the past. Uh, yeah. So when it comes to firing, I'm not a big fan of just walking in and be like, that's it, 86 on. Um, but there's really an interesting way to handle that transition because you've got to get Dr. Jones isn't here anymore and, you know, Dr. Smith, like, we're two different places, two different people. Now these are two different practices, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, I mean, you know, so Kelly can tell you uh, an interesting anecdote to, to, you know, how you might tackle that. I mean, honestly, you know, just like you've said, new doctors bought into the practice. They're excited, you yeah. know, they're excited. They're ready to go. And then you've got a staff who's dug their heels in, you know, yes we're blindsided. We're not excited. We're scared. We're worried. We don't know you. We don't know if you're a good dentist. Um, you know, so it, I came from a, a retail background. Um, I was a general manager for a department store, mm -hmm. um, you know, so 85 employees at one time, you were running your own HR, your own payroll, all of those things. So, so it is, it, it is a little bit, um, I think based on past precedents, but mm -hmm. uh, what we used to do in a retail environment is we would walk in and, and we would explain that a new manager has taken over and everyone is fired. Everyone, you're fired. And now wow. we're, and now <laughs> we're gonna conduct interviews to rehire you because the fact of the matter is Dr. Jones no longer practices. He doesn't pay you anymore. Essentially, he fired you. He sold the practice to Dr. Smith and Dr. Smith is now your dentist and you can choose to work here or you can choose not to. We hope everybody stays. We want you to stay. We want to value what you bring to the table. And we know we didn't buy a broken practice. Um, you know, but we don't know how you'll want to work with us or if you'll want to work with us. So now we're going to sit down and we're going to talk to you one on one. And at the end of that conversation, if you decide you want to work somewhere else, it's better to do it today than it is to do it in a month when we think everything's good and the transition is smooth and then we're blindsided. Um, you know, so if we do that from the beginning, the loyalty with the employees is now to Dr. Smith. He's the new yeah. owner. He hired me. Dr. Jones abandoned me. Dr. Smith hired me. Right. Um, you know, it, it is, I mean, it is kind of a harsh take, but we've seen it be very successful. Um, and I like that approach. That's the most unique approach I've heard with this. And I, I definitely agree with it because I have had clients who 
have had to step in and put their foot down and say, look, we plan on, you know, building a world-class practice. And we're spending a lot of time and effort to do that. And if you're not on the same page as us, start looking for another job because right. it's not going to be like the practice you were with five years ago. And, you know, after having that conversation, it, it can come off as a little harsh, but we would see almost overnight improvement. Like there were cases where, you know, we were so, like so struggling to get the staff to get Google reviews or testimonial videos from patients. And they're saying, oh, we're asking everybody. It's just nobody wants to leave them. It's like, you haven't logged into the system in two months. Like you, you're not trying. Like, okay, they're not right. fooling anybody. <laughs> Um, the dashboard you know, is, is the bad. dashboard is a lie. It says the last time you logged in is when we sent you the password two months ago right. and you never looked at it. Um, and then they had this conversation and like overnight they'll get like 40 reviews, right? So um it definitely it's like there is a good way to have it where you can be honest and open and you know, I'm not, not trying to hurt their feelings, but you know, you need to get across how serious this is, right? And that like we're not going to do things the way it was done before. So I, I think that approach is really interesting. I, I think a lot of people try to massage and say, well, you got to get them on the same page, this and that. It's like sometimes you, you know, you kind of have to crack the whip to some extent uh, to get that little shock and awe and then go back to let's build a great practice together, right? Because dentists can't do it on their own. And like, as John said, you're not going to have a million uh, amazing people looking for a job within five kilometers of your practice, you know, it, it can be hard to find replacement. So um, I like that approach. Does it ever yeah. backfire? Does, does anyone, did the, the ever I mean, people yeah. walk out there, and ask? People leave, people leave, but they're the same people who were going to leave two months into it. They're the same people who are going to leave four months into it. And we yeah. know the value of an employee once they're trained um, you can't really put a dollar amount on that, you know, but it can take two years to get somebody who has no experience in dentistry to, to understand the language, the procedures, the schedule, all of those things. So yeah. there's a lot of time invested in this. So we don't want to walk yeah. in and just lose people, but we do need to grab their attention. We need to remind them that their loyalty is now to us. You yeah. know, if he was such a good doctor, he'd have told you he was selling his practice. He didn't. He didn't value you. You know, yeah. I think the most seamless um, takeovers are, are ones where a doctor is honest. He's telling them I'm retiring. I'm getting out. I'm bringing in Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith is going to work here with me for a few months and then I'm going to step out and Dr. Smith is going to take over. I think yeah. that's probably the most seamless and best case scenario. But yeah. in a situation where the staff was not informed, um, I'm not trying to throw the doctor under the bus, but he didn't care enough about you to tell you he was getting out. So mm -hmm. now it's time for me to say, I care enough to keep you. Let's move forward. You know, mm -hmm. so I mean, it it can backfire. It can be uh, a difficult transition, but it, it's one system that now that employee, if they really value their job, has a loyalty to that doctor. And we're walking hand in hand instead of working against each other. Yeah, it, it's, it, I, I definitely agree with your approach because I'm thinking that about my business. And, you know, we, we tell our sales reps and account managers, like, if, you, if there's going to be a clash, have it early. If there's a bit, like, don't try to, you know, be whatever that dentist wants to, just to get them to sign a proposal. If you start to sense that there's issues, start to bring them to the surface right away, because either you're going to talk about it and get through it and you're going to have a stronger relationship, or you're going to find out really quickly that is not the type of client we want to work with, right? right? And I think people in general are very, you know, they're a, a averse to conflict. They don't want to bring things to the surface. But like you said, those people end up quitting anyway. It's like and all the clients where we try to massage things and, you know, like, okay, sure. I mean, we'll, we'll do it your way. You know, it's never worked. I haven't have a single situation where it's ever worked. It, it, would, it would have been so much better to uh, realize like we're not the right fit. Okay. Let's not waste each other's time. Uh, let, let's just move on. You know, um, then if we, you know, let's, let's see what we can do. We'll try to make it work. And then six months later, they end up leaving anyways. Right. Or usually like six months, they, they won't last them more than a month or two. And it ends up being such a huge waste of time trying to do that project. And I think with staff, like, like you said, that it takes a lot of energy and a lot of time and money to 
turn somebody into an excellent employee, like a well-trained, like a person that is driving a lot of value for the practice. You don't want to waste those resources trying to train the right person. It is better to figure out whether they're going to be a good fit earlier, even if it, it is an uncomfortable conversation. Yeah. So I, 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 I like that approach quite a lot. Now, one thing I've noticed is, um, you know, leadership is, uh, I think a really key thing from that's important for, for a dentist, right? Like practices that I've worked with where, you know, some practices bring in a million dollars of revenue, some of them bring in two or three or four. It's never because the, the practices that do much better is not because, uh, of SEO, right. It's not because of marketing or anything like that. Generally, one different, like one consistent thing I've seen is the dentists that runs like that run really great practices. They're just great leaders. Like they're positive. They empower their people. People like working for them. They want to see them succeed. Uh, you know, when you have a team that that uh, you know is all hands on deck, trying to help, you, trying to see, trying to make sure that you're successful, you're going to have an easy time running that business. Vice versa, if the team hates you, like you could be the best dentist on the planet. You could have the nicest office. You're just not going to get very far. So leadership, I think, is something a lot of dentists struggle with because it's not really taught in dental school. Um, it's not necessarily something that they're inherently great at because a lot of them are more like scientists at heart. They're very data-driven. They're very logical people. Um, can you improve leadership as a dentist? Is it better to just hire a really good office manager that knows how to manage a team? Like, how do you deal with that? Like, you know, can can somebody who doesn't have great leadership skills improve that and become a better leader? Or, you know, like, how, how do you deal with this problem as a dentist? Well, there's a couple of different ways you can handle that. Obviously, uh, some people will struggle a little bit more to become the kind of a leader that maybe they think that they need to be. And some people are just, you know, naturally gifted at leading people, you know, it's just easy to follow certain people. Um, and, you know, there are leaders that will lead by example and encourage and just be the kind of person that you want to do everything for. And then there are leaders who are more visionary type people and that say, hey, like you said, hey, we're going to do some great things at this practice. We're going to take it to the next level. We're going to get to this level and then we're going to go there. And then um, they've got all these great ideas and they might be just hitting home run after home run with their ideas, um, but they might not might not be the most peopley person, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah exactly. uh, they might have some great chair side manner, um, but you know they've got a lot of irons in the fire, so they're under you know stresses that you know no employees are going to see. So you know for that type of uh, a doctor, you know the best thing that you can do as a leader is a point a quality office manager or, and have team leaders. So that way, if a dental assistant has an issue, they have a person that they can go to that's not the dentist to distract them at a time when the dentist does not want to be distracted. Um, you know, and the person wants to be heard and you're not going to get the undivided attention that you, you know, that person might be expecting. So to have a team leader in place that might be able to solve the problem in the snap of a finger and everything is okay, and everyone can move on about their day, doctor doesn't even know what's happened, right? Right. Um, so, you know, I, I think that there's more than one answer to your question in that regard. So right. uh, setting up that system and having a hierarchy uh, within that system, that different you know, employees can go to if they have an issue or a question, um, you know, makes a huge difference. And, and I think that's something that that corporate America does well. Corporate America does organizational structures well. Um, mm -hmm. You have middle management, upper management, lower management. You know, and that's something that that I think dental practices miss out on because a lot of these people never worked in corporate America. You know, they yeah, that's a good school, point. Yeah, you know, they started their practice, um, and, and so I think that's true. I think I think no one. Um, in an owner or manager um, position ever wants to hear, can I talk to you for a second? You know, and especially a dentist who's trying to, to prep 10 veneers, um, yeah. you know, doesn't want to hear, can I talk to you for a second? You know, <laughs> um, so I think, you know, John makes a great point that, you know, if, if you have a structure in place, it, I mean, some some people are, easy to work for, like John said, and people want to follow them. And then other people 
um, in leadership positions have to force their hand to get people to follow. Um, and in return, some employees want to do the right thing and follow, and other employees are a little bit defiant, um, you know, just have a different mindset. Maybe they want to work smarter and not harder, you know, mm -hmm. so it, it, it is a good balance. And I don't think one person inside a practice can be everything everyone needs. Um, yeah. You know, you know, as parenting, you know, it's good to have two parents because there's one who's good cop and one who's bad cop. You know, we have to yeah. kind of manage that. And it's the same thing within a practice. You know, one owner cannot be everything to everyone, including his patients and his staff. Um, mm -hmm. So no matter how well your leadership is, you just it's impossible to do that. Um, I think people can become better leaders. I think there's enough self-help books and podcasts and leadership training. None of this is new, you know, yeah. um, doing it, you know, since the dawn of time. But um, I don't know how long Seven Habits of Highly Effective Leaders has been around, but it seems like it's been decades. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, and that, that's yeah. a fantastic book as well. Now, you, you touched on something that uh, I want to dive into a bit more. So you mentioned the, the corporate structure, and I completely agree with you. It's like when we started a business years ago, we had this you know, wacky idea of like, you know, we're going to do things differently. You know, we're not going to be like every other company. We're going to, you know... Uh, we came with such a quirky business model and, you know, thinking that like, you know, we don't like big corporate companies and how they do things and how they treat people. And like, we're, we're going to come up with a completely different way to run a business. And we spent years going in circles, accomplishing nothing. Like the business wasn't like, it was bringing in money, but it wasn't keeping any of it. It was just a disaster. Um, and, you know, over the last few years, like we've really built like a very solid business, very profitable business. And because, you know, we realized that, Corporate America does, they, they do know a thing or two about business structure. They're not building things the way they're building them because they, they're, you know, they want to oppress their people or they want to be evil or anything like that. Like, it's just a good logical system to follow. There's a reason you have a hierarchy. There's a reason you have managers. There's a reason why, you know, certain responsibilities are in certain people's hands. And the more we, uh, we realize, like, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Like, there's a, there's a good system there that people have scaled multi-million dollar businesses with. And they do it for a reason that way. And the more we started to approach that and look at like how are traditional, like successful businesses operating and to some extent putting the pieces in place before you get to that size, right? Because um, there's this sort of thinking of this works for us for now. And as we get bigger, we'll change. It's like, well, you'll never get bigger. <laughs> you have to look at how bigger businesses work and then adopt their model. And that's how, that's how you will get bigger. Right. So um well, that's a good segue, yeah, yeah because uh, like you said, if a doctor says, you know, I want to be, I'm a million dollar practice, I want to be a three million dollar practice, and then when I get up to that level, then we'll start to put some other, you know, pieces in place. Yeah. Um, no, it's completely backwards. Don't wait until you grow. If you plan on growing, then, you know, add another column in your schedule, hire a couple more people, and yeah, yes. it might be a strain on uh, your payroll initially, but if the idea is to grow, now you've already got the pieces in place and I mean, the track's already laid down. So just keep the train on rolling. Yeah. You um, have to operate like the type of business you want to become before you become that business. Right. Uh, you have to put the pieces in place. Right. So I think uh, some practices, they, they don't spend enough time thinking like how large do I really want to grow? And if, if I, you know, let's say their goal is to be a $3 million practice, 4 million, whatever it is, um, what would that business need to look like? How would you actually need to operate? What people would you need in um, to put it in charge? And you might not have all of them today, but you start to form a clearer picture of like what you need to aim towards as an organizational structure in terms of systems, processes, and things like that. Because uh, it won't happen organically. You won't run like a business one way and then somehow it'll magically just become more successful. And I tell people like, you know, um, if you look at a company like Apple, they, they didn't start off by building some half-assed products. And then when they started to become really successful, then they started to build really good products, right? It's like, no, you, you have to you do a good job to begin with before you see the results, right? So uh, it's like, if you want to increase your, your you know, triple your practice, like you got to start taking the customer service seriously, the, the business structure, the training, uh, you're not going to get there with the way you're doing it today. Um, now I, I'm curious, like one, one way, uh, that I've seen dentists try to tackle this sort of like staff motivation, uh, issue, you know, trying to push your staff to accomplish more is financial incentives. 
And I'm kind of torn on this because I've seen cases where it's worked really well, where, you know, a dentist will come in with like a stack of gift cards and say like, look, every time you get a Google review, I'm going to give you a $10 Starbucks gift card. And they'll get like 50 reviews in a week or some practices, they give them um, a percentage of the booked treatment, right? Like a sort of like a sales incentive. And it's worked well where, you know, the a practice would go from booking maybe $25,000 worth of treatment uh, in a month to $75,000 in a month. Uh, but I've also seen cases where it turns into a, a total disaster and it just blows up in the dentist's face where now all of a sudden you have staff that aren't willing to lift a finger unless there's a bonus involved or the bonuses drive a lot of internal clashing because people argue about, well, actually that was my patient and I booked them because I talked to them two weeks ago. And even though Kelly booked them, you know, yesterday, it really, it was, I'm the one who deserves this. It, just, it turns into a nightmare, right? So um, I'm wondering from you guys, from your experience, do you like financial incentives uh, or not? If you do, is there a good way to implement them? Or like, what are some uh, cautionary tales to sort of watch out for? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I turn it back around to the doctor initially and say, okay, well, what are your goals? What is it that you're actually trying to accomplish? Mm-hmm. Uh, and how is that going to benefit your practice? Right. Um, so if you're just going to lay out some goals, then there's got to be a financial benefit to the doctor just as much as there is to the employee. Um, so if you're going to give your employee 50 bucks, well, then you or the practice needs to benefit, you know, uh, you know, a couple hundred or 300 bucks off of that 50. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you know, you're lowering your own salary at that point to do what exactly. Um, so, you know, your specific goals as a practice, um, you know, has to be defined before you can decide like, okay, how are we going to get there? And how am I going to incentivize, you know, getting to that next level? Mm-hmm. And, and so you've got to have that kind of planned out rather than just say, Hey, here's, here's a, a bonus system that we're going to use. And, uh, man, we're going to get a thousand reviews, uh, man, people are going to give us five stars on Facebook or, or whatever it might be. Um, like I said, you know, but what are you going to really get out of that? Yeah, well, that's I, a, sorry, go ahead, Kel. Well, I was going to interject and say, you know, we've seen practices where they have bonus systems in place that are meant to be motivating and they end up becoming demotivating Mm -hmm. um, staff. You know, maybe the goals aren't attainable. Maybe, um, you know, the dentist has this really high benchmark and he wants to get there. So he sets this extravagant prize at the end. Um, but the staff is doing everything possible and can never get the extravagant prize. And so now they just become like, what does it even matter? Um, or we have dentists who, like you say, get frustrated because now they're incentivizing people just to do their jobs. It like yeah. I hire you, I pay you. And, and so now the dentist is reluctant to give um, whatever incentive or bonus because now you won't even answer the phone unless I pay you a dollar to answer the phone. Right, so, right. you know, we want to make sure that that if there's a bonus system in place, that that it meets a certain criteria. Mm-hmm. The bonus system can't be to make someone do their job. It's a yeah. going above and beyond what your job is. So right now your job is this. We want to go above and beyond that job. So, you know, some of the things might be working through lunch to do same day service on a patient. Um, You know, it might be staying late to help that patient get financed, whatever. You know, we want that. We want it to be very clearly defined. But in order to do that, you have to have a structure where the person knows what their job is. A lot of dentists don't have position descriptions. They don't know what their Mm. job is. They just do what they're told when they're told. Um, You know, so we want a bonus system in place for going above and beyond. We want a bonus system in place that encourages daily, weekly, monthly productivity. It it can't be hit or miss, um, you know, because then that becomes demotivating. Um, Right. right. You know, so and we want it to be beneficial, like John was saying, for the doctor, if if the incentive is $50, then the doctor better be two and a half or three or four times, you know, what the employee is getting. And then that way it's rewarding to both. And that way the staff feels appreciated and the doctor feels appreciative to the staff. Uh, yeah, that, that's a great point because I've seen cases where it's like they don't think it out very well. 
and the stat hits the metric and the doctor realizes like, well, this isn't really that worth it for me to pay you that much. So they, like, they, they change the bonus at the last minute and it's like a balloon deflating, right? It's just like, right. people are like, why do we waste it? And then you lose trust because it's like, you know, right. next time they do another system, it's like, yeah, like last time, right? Where at the last minute exactly. you pulled the rug from under us because you realized it didn't make sense. So <laughs> I, I agree. I think that you need to really think about what, what are you trying to accomplish, right? What, if you accomplish that, what is it really worth to you financially, right? How can you share a portion of that? And I think what Kelly mentioned is also very accurate is you don't want to be in a situation where it's like, I already pay you a very good salary, you know, what to do a job, right? Like uh, it's, there's not a bonus attached to everything, right? And the bonus should be if you exceed what, you know, beyond what, what is normally expected. And, and you're right. I don't think a lot of dentists like really sit down and think like, what is your job description? What, what, it, what does a going above and beyond mean? Because I have seen some practices where, I mean, I've listened to phone calls, like real phone calls where like a patient calls on like a Friday at 4.30 and practice closes at five. And they tell them like, oh, I already turned off my computer. Can you call us back on Monday? Like, like you, you do hear these things and right. it's, it's like, okay, you know, this, this is an issue. Uh, and but yeah, if a staff member, calling in. Sorry? That could have been a full mouth rehab calling in. Oh yeah, yeah. Like there's cases yeah, where, yeah, okay. who knows? The funniest one we've ever had was uh, somebody was calling in about Invisalign and the receptionist working for like four or five months said, oh, I, I don't think we do that here. So I, and the person was confused because it was like, well, I'm <laughs> looking at the Invisalign page on your website. Uh, and then he asked like, well, is there like another place you can recommend? And she gave him directions to the guy down the street. And we messaged the doctors like, why didn't you tell us you stopped doing Invisalign? Like we're spending, we spent thousands promoting this. And I was like, what do you mean we do Invisalign? What are you talking about? Uh, it's like, are you not even paying attention? To, yeah. And then we send them the phone call and they said like, oh my God, I, we are going to address this ASAP. So then this happens all the time is there is a disc. I, th I don't think, I think what you're touching upon is that dentists don't clearly communicate uh, what is expected of the staff. They don't, they're always operating in this sort of bubble of confusion of like, I don't know, am I doing a good job? Like, what is my job? It's not written down anywhere. Yeah. You know, it seems to change every minute. Uh, so I think once you probably build a better structure around that. And then you establish like, what is expectations? What is above expectations? What, uh, what does that really mean to the practice and how much of that improvement in, in revenue or like how much of that can we share with the staff to, so that they, they share in the rewards as well. But it, there is a structure there where it doesn't change, you know, uh, if, if the dentist like wakes up the next day and decides, oh, I maybe, this, maybe I gave him too much and let's, let's just, let's just wipe that away, right? Like, and it becomes very demotivating. Right, yeah. they need to be written down. I mean, mm, everyone needs to have point. the yeah. rules. Everyone needs to have the rules of what it is um, because we can forget, we can, but yeah. this, these principles are not new. I mean, remember when you were in first grade and if you brought in the most canned goods for the food drive, you got the pizza party. It, yeah. It's not a new system. Um, yeah. You know, incentives are, aren't new. We give them to our kids, you know, we, we we look forward to this vacation we've been saving for incentives aren't new everyone yeah. uses them in a certain way but we want the rules to be clear and then yeah. you know there's different there's a difference between a long term bonus and a short term one if you want more google reviews then set a thing that says for 30 days for 30 days mm -hmm. well we're going to drive this ship and at the end of 30 days, that's going to be off the table. Maybe not. Maybe I like it. We'll keep rolling with it. But for 30 days, mm -hmm. you'll get $10 for every review you get. You know, make it tangible, make it attainable. Um, I definitely like writing it down. You're, you're absolutely right. Because when we set up a bonus system for our account managers and our sales reps, we wrote it down and exactly like you said, people always remember different things. Like, oh, I thought it worked this way. It's like, well, it's a good thing we all wrote it down and agreed and on it. And everyone has a copy. <laughs> and everyone has a copy. So we go down the list and be like, no, this is what it was supposed to be. That's how we're going to fall. We can change it later, but like, no, it's very clear what we all agreed to. And I don't think uh, very many dentists would have that. They, I'm sure they, a lot of them try bonuses, but if I were to ask them like, is this written down somewhere that like everyone you know, signed off on or agreed to, I guess, this is how it works. I bet you the answer 99.9% .9 of cases would be no, they, they never, they never did that. Yeah. Well, and I, I think what I 
we probably should try and convey uh, as far as, you know, kind of this generalized topic that we have of, you know, marketing is here, the front desk and the systems are here, and they never really quite get together because mm -hmm. marketing isn't as aware of what all the goals are of the practice, and maybe they don't ask. And the front yeah. desk doesn't know about what's going on with marketing because the doc didn't tell them. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is get this overlap between the two. And it's sort of like um, if, if you were going to go to a personal trainer and say, hey, listen, I really want to get into shape. Um, you know, you want something from that personal trainer and that personal trainer would like to have you as a client, but you're going to both ask each other a whole bunch of questions of fact finding to try and make sure that you get the goals lined up because it's not as easy as just going, okay, well, here's a workout. It's going to be Monday, Wednesday, Friday. This is what you do. And, you know, they don't ask the person if they have any like pain in their knees or their lower back. Um, oh, or, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. They don't, they don't ask, um, you know, well, what specific goals or what are you trying to do? You're going to try and turn them into a triathlete when all they're really trying to do is just make their back stop hurting all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Way Or if they do want to become, you know, uh, better at, maybe they do want to be a triathlete. So now we've got to completely change gears. You walk into a personal trainer. I walk in, we're both going to walk out with two completely different plans of action. And yeah. you and I are going to have two completely ideas of what our ideal goals are. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I definitely fun. see that you, I see that with a lot of marketing companies who just like have a menu of services and it's like, what would you like to buy? Would you want to do some AdWords, some SEO, some whatever. Right. And they never stop to ask like, what, what are you trying to accomplish here? Like yeah, what is, cool. yeah. Like in six months, what is going to, what needs to happen for you to turn around and say like, I'm really happy I hired you guys. Right. And sometimes, yeah, right. you know, you ask this question and it's not what you think it is because it's like, oh, I just want to work less. <laughs> I want my associates to take over and not have the business depend on me. And it's like, oh, I thought you just wanted SEO. It's like, no, it, it, yeah. it's often much more complicated. Yeah. And yeah, I think that we can measure our excess in marketing by how much the phone rings. I mean, yeah, that's kind of a nice indicator. But, you know, if if we're not making the phone ring with the right kind of patient, you know, if they're watching Judge Judy, um, chances are they're not going to get a couple of implants, right? Yeah. Um, you know, their insurance isn't going to pay for it. They have insurance, right? Um, we love court shows, by the way. I don't know. <laughs> and I, 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 I used to watch Maury as a kid. It was, it's a, yeah. it's a pleasure. It's, you know, uh, nothing, but I, I definitely understand like people who will have the time to like watch that every day. They probably don't have the kind of job that it's going to afford a thirty thousand dollar month, re, you know, full yeah. rehabilitation. So, yeah, uh, most yeah. often. I mean, so um, you know, we want to make sure that we're going to target the right, you know, uh, type of potential new patient. Um, but we also understand where the practice wants to go. Are we are mm -hmm. we trying to, um, you know, advertise something just like you said, fifty nine dollar cleaning? Well, that's a different type of an ad and a placement than it is if we're going to be, you know, talking about doing all on fours. Yeah. Um, something that's going to cost 30, 40, 50,000 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, so the conversation of marketing has immediately changed uh, between the marketing company and, and the doctor. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you got to fill in the front desk that, you know, your, your office manager or whomever the rock star is answering the phone has to be filled in on that. Um, yeah. So, so I, I think, you know, there needs to be conversation between uh, marketing agencies and, um, you know, the dentist. And, you know, if the dentist kind of offers some answers that are like, OK, well, maybe you're not going to be ready. I don't want to back out because you're not quite there. Maybe what you need to do is bring somebody in, um, you know, like a consulting you know, individual or a company that can help prepare your staff and help make sure that you've got a system in place that is going to optimize what you're doing. You know, yeah. going back to the analogy about going to the personal trainer, they give you the workout, but then they leave out the part about how you're supposed to eat. Mm -hmm. And when you don't get the results that you are expecting after, you know, three or four months, you've given all this money, you put out all this effort, man, I had a great workout, man, let's go to McDonald's. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. then you're wondering why, you know, your pants size isn't changing. <laughs> yeah. You expect it is because yeah. you didn't have that discussion. You didn't prepare them. So, Hey, listen, you're going to want to make sure and up your water intake. You're going to re reduce this, eliminate that. And, yeah. 
And yeah, the like, well, gosh, you know, I, it costs way more money to do that. But for you to reach your goal, is that a worthy investment or not? Absolutely. So it's kind of so, you know, yeah, you're kind of adding a third tier into that between marketing and the practice goals. Well, you might bring in a consultant, but if it's going to help you optimize the money that you're spending every single month on advertising, um, you know, I think a lot of times the math would work out to where it's worth it. Well, and and we we as as office administration um, and as 406, we want marketing companies to be held to to an ethical standard. Mm -hmm. Don't pitch a product to a doctor that includes a dashboard that you know he's not going to run. Mm -hmm. He is not involved in that. So don't have a conversation and onboard a dentist if he doesn't have the right players in the onboarding meeting. You yeah. know, I want to onboard you on Thursday, but I can't onboard you on Thursday unless you have a dedicated person who's going to be running the dashboard and that person is going to be on the onboarding call. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've got to make a partner inside the practice. Um, no matter what it, whether it's AdWords or SEO, whatever it is, you've got to make a partner in the practice. And, you know, we've, we've had practices in the past where the dentist started a new, um, Facebook campaign that had a callback feature. Mm -hmm. Um, so over the weekend, this started, he told no one that he was doing it on mm -hmm. Monday morning, the phone rang. 72,000 times. And every time they answered it, no one was there. Well, eventually they go back to the dentist and they're like, something's wrong with the phones because the phones just keep ringing and then nobody is there. And then the dentist is like, we'll call the phone company, do all these things. And then one person like stays on the phone forever when there's no one there. And then they hear a connection come through. And the person says, hello. And they say, this office, how can we help you? And they say, you called me. I didn't call you. The phone was ringing. <laughs> I answered the phone. Yeah. You know, and then the person's like, who did you say you were? Well, we're a dental office. Uh, uh, well, that's the same office. I filled this thing out on Facebook. Um, so you guys were calling me back, I guess. No one knew. No one knew anything. And now we've paid all this money and that phone wasn't answered and we hung up on 72,000 patients and those patients are all mad. You know, mm -hmm. so so there needs to be an ethical standard, you know, with with a marketing company that it's not the dentist. He's not going to run it. He's not the one. So who's going to be the who's your point person? Let's introduce yeah. me to your point person. Let's sit down. The same thing. They go to, to midwinter in Chicago. They sign up for all these things. They went by themselves with their spouse. Their spouse doesn't work in the practice. They come home from midwinter and they're like, we signed up on all these different things. You got a new software company. You got a new whatever. You know, take someone with you to midwinter if you're going to be doing this. Yeah. <laughs> take yeah, someone, yeah. you know, have a partner in the practice. Um, you know, you have a you have boots on the ground if you make someone in the practice accountable for a system um, that you can call when the doctor isn't texting you back and isn't calling you. Well, and not only that, you're building value in your employee. You're telling them by bringing them on and involving them in that process, you're telling them, hey, you're really important here. I trust what you're doing. You're great at what you do. So now I'm going to bring you in on a part of the business that I ordinarily wouldn't tell anybody about. And so again, that's a, a, a part of leader, leadership is when you do that, you automatically made that person feel way more important than they felt five seconds before you said something to them about it. And now they're on board and now they're like, hey, I've got to, you know, I, I want to make sure that I keep the doc happy and uh, keep doing a good job because now they're, uh, you know, bringing me on to, with, with all this added responsibility. And, um, you know, now they're fighting for you, right? So yeah, I think that a lot of practices are missing that sort of system of accountability. Nobody knows who's in charge of what. Uh, a lot of stuff gets thrown at them because the dentist signs up to some random thing they saw. Um, yeah, there's a lot of clients we've decided not to take on. They're always really shocked about it because we said, like, I don't think you um, really thought this through or I don't think this is going to be successful because, you know, 
you can't just sign a check and then throw this into your business and then expect it's going to succeed. If you're not the one that's going to do this and uh, you haven't, like you're, you don't have somebody on board in your company that's going to work with our systems, this isn't going to go anywhere. It's going to be a waste of everybody's time. And I think most of them are so used to companies who, if somebody calls, they've already made the decision of like, I want to sign you up. It doesn't matter if the practice like is not at that the right stage. It doesn't matter if they don't have the right people in place. It doesn't matter if like their solution isn't necessarily what the practice needs to focus on, focus on at this stage, right? They're determined to make the sale. And uh, I think it's silly because even for, for them, it's like, a lot of these clients don't stick around. I mean, you, you see it with uh, dentistry. There's such a bad rap with marketing companies because a lot of them, I, I have never worked with a dentist where we're the first marketing company or the first you know company to work with them. I mean, they've all had like three, four or five websites. They've all worked with a bunch of people that did marketing, um, you know, but no one stopped to ask like, where are you at? What people do you have? Well, like, let's really sit down and figure out uh, what the issues are with your business. Like you mentioned with the personal trainer example, uh, it's like, why are you trying to do this? Like, you know, maybe you do have knee problems and like these exercises that are, that normally may make sense for most people don't make sense for you. I don't think these conversations usually happen. They're, you know, like, here's what we do. Here's our three packages, pick one, you know, we'll get started next week. And, you know, uh, it typically doesn't, doesn't go anywhere. Um, so to wrap things up, what, what I kind of wanted to leave, uh, like, um, uh, end things with is, you know, we both know that there's no magic pill solution, right? Like there's no one thing that, you know, you're just going to come in and, and flip this switch and all of a sudden everything just kind of clicks for the practice. This is kind of what a lot of dentists are sort of looking for. They want to find that one thing that, you know, ideally all you have to do is sign a check and then magically it'll just be fixed. You know, someone's going to come in and, and do that. Obviously it doesn't make any sense. Um, but as you work with more and more dentists, you definitely do see patterns of like, you know, common things that, uh, a lot of them struggle with that if they could fix generally will lead to much better results, right? Everyone's situation is, is unique, but there are definitely patterns there that a lot of dentists sort of fall into. So I'm wondering from your experience, what is a, you know, a one or two common things where it's like, we see this a lot. And uh, maybe the dentists don't. And if you were to really put a lot of effort to fixing this issue, you're definitely going to see the needle move. So is there like a, you know, a few things that stand out to you guys as a recurring theme of, of why practices aren't growing you know, at a faster rate than they could be? Well, I think a lot of it uh, we've touched on throughout the conversation is that they don't have these hard conversations uh, with their marketing companies. Um, they don't ask maybe the right questions and the right questions aren't asked to them. And so there's always going to be this space between what each company is trying to accomplish for the other. And um, it just winds up with disappointment. But yeah. so like you're saying, you know, you, you, you chat and you're interviewing the doctor just as much as they're interviewing you. Yeah. And at some point you're going to go, eh, this is probably not going to be a good fit for us because we're not going to wind up, you know, uh, getting them to the point where they want because they're not prepared or their goals maybe aren't clearly defined. Um, so I think that's a big part of it is just having a good candid discussion um, because yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we want to have another client. Um, if we didn't, then we wouldn't be having the conversation we're having. But at the yeah. same time, we want to make sure that this is going to be a good fit, um, you know, because we could come in with the greatest ideas in the world. But if you're not bought in and you don't help us get your employees bought in, yeah. then what's going to happen is you're going to fire us in a couple of months and then you're going to just say how terrible we are when, you know, truth of the matter is like you didn't set specific expectations and we didn't set specific expectations. And so we both fail. And that's not good for either side. So, and I mean, it definitely happens with staff. I think Kelly, you're right. Like people don't have these very candid conversations of like, I get that this is how it was working for 10, 15 years, you know, that that old dentist ran things, but uh, we're going to do things differently. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, yeah, like you, you waste a lot of time, um, you know, on the wrong people, whether it's the wrong marketing company, the wrong consultant, the wrong employees, the wrong anything uh, by, by trying to avoid these, what I think probably most people think are awkward conversations or really hard conversations, but you have to have them um, or else you're, 
you're 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 delaying what is eventually going to be a bomb that blows up in your face. Right? Well, and another thing I think that we also should point out is that marketing companies a lot of times don't they don't know to respect the idea that every single dental office and every single dentist is going to be different. They're going to have different personalities. They're going to have different staff. They're going to have a different culture. They're going to have different types of dentistry that they enjoy or that they're well skilled at doing. And if you just come in, like you said, with just this basic, hey, just what you like, we're trying to fit the, the square piece in the round. Right. Hole. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't go. And, um, you know, there's way too much effort in going into forcing whenever you just take the time to find the square peg to go in the square hole. And I um, mean, so with a little bit more time and planning and fact finding, okay, well, you know, what kind of patients are you looking for? What do you know? What are your goals as a practice? You know, what? Um, you know, what is your hygienist really good at? You know, how many assistants do you utilize? How's your front desk person? And, you know, going and finding like, okay, well, how is this going to work best? And yeah. again, like I said, respecting the fact that they've got a little bit different culture than the guy you just got off the phone with uh, two days ago that you started a campaign with, because what works for that doctor is not going to work for this doctor. You know, where's the practice located? So um, I think, I, I think too, to interject, you said culture a couple of times. I mean, yeah. in order to be successful, um, the office has to have the culture that the dentist is wanting and he has to be able to create that and the right employees, you mentioned it, you know, just before John, the right employees, um, are going to create that successful roadmap for you. Um, but also empowering the employees that you may not feel like are the right ones. Um, mm -hmm. you know, maybe when they worked for this doctor, they, they, they weren't, their potential wasn't unlocked and yeah. maybe you're a different kind of leader. And so you can unlock that potential that this guy said, whatever you do, don't keep her. She's not any good, you know, mm -hmm. but maybe she's your best employee. Um, you know, so so culture, I think, is huge. I think if you want to be successful in a practice, you better figure out what you want that culture to look like. And everything you do better be driven towards that, um, whether it's marketing, whether it's hiring. You like Sally. Sally's your best assistant. Hire Sally's friends. Go find Sally's friends. Then you've got an office of like minded people. Um, you know, if Sally leaves, you're you're out of luck because all her friends will leave. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, you, you definitely have to focus on culture. You know, yeah. that, that's important. Hey, I, I think it's just being honest with yourself, what type of business you really want. And I, I agree with like, I think as a, as a, any sort of service-based business, it's fine to have that square peg. As long as you can be um, authentic and communicate with people that like, if we think, you're, you know, you're the round hole, like this doesn't fit for you. And I think a lot of companies, uh, they're not honest about that. They're, you know, they try to make it seem like their product will work for anybody. Right. Um, and what we've tried to do, you know, and I think we've been successful with this is helping our people see that not every dentist is a good fit. If they don't meet this criteria, they're not a bad dentist. It's just, they're definitely not going to work with our product. Like it is not going to fit. And I, I do not want to spend a lot of time trying to force this down. Right. Um, you know, or, or some companies where it's like, okay, if you do want to be more flexible and come up with customized solutions, then you definitely have to sit down and have those in-depth conversations about what are you trying to, to, to sort of accomplish. So it sounds like you guys are, you know, kind of like mold to what the dentist really needs. Our company, like, uh, we're very much like productized. It's like, this is what works. And we're going to try to figure out whether it'll fit. And if it doesn't fit, we'll let you know right away, because it's going to be a waste of our time, waste of your time. Like, this is going to be such a bad experience. But if it fits, it's great, right? Like, if, if that, that cable connects to the right port, it's, it's going to be perfect. But we're not going to force it down, right? Yeah. Well, it's just like if you were uh, all of a sudden named the head football coach, uh, you know, of a football team. And it would be silly for you to just jump in there, have a meeting with all of the, the players and say, OK, everyone's going to learn how to throw a pass. Everyone's mm -hmm. going to learn how to kick field goals like that's 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 not the way to do things. I mean, you need to you know take what attributes, uh, you know, each of these players have according to their position and make them the yeah. very best at what they can do there. And yeah. it's the same yes. way, you know, in working with a dental office, you know, let's take, you know, what they are. And let's make them better at what they do rather than scrap it and try and rebuild and make force them into something that they don't even want to be in. 
Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the last thing a doctor wants to do is hate having to go to their office because yeah. it's structured in a way that, you know, they don't really agree with, but then they're trying to, you know, just grit their teeth every day because so-and-so marketing company or consulting company it's says, them that this is the best way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah. Now, now they're not, you know, they don't even own their own practice at that point. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? You know, the oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. The practice you owns them. Yeah, yeah. You see this a lot with like uh, uh, dentists who sell to like big corporations or DSOs. And, you know, um, you know, if your objective is to run a practice that takes care of people that you like coming to work every day, that might not be in line with the corporation who's just trying to like pad the bottom bottom line. Right. So um, I think, yeah, the, the takeaway for me is definitely having honest and what might seem like really tough conversations with your staff, your vendors, like really getting to the bottom of like, is, does this actually make sense? Are, is our vision in line, right? Um, because like what you just mentioned, Kelly, is like, you know, you guys were doing a lot of, um, the, the old company was doing a lot of marketing, getting a lot of phone calls, but it's like, they're not the type of patients we want to deal with. Somebody calling us and, you know, you hear people's court in the background. It's like, this person is not going to want to go to a fee-for-service practice. We're wasting so much time trying to talk to them. There's so many no-shows, right? And, you know, how do you get to that situation? Probably there wasn't an honest talk with uh, between the dentist and the marketing company to say, does this actually fit correctly? Or, you know, are we both operating in our own little silo and, you know, we're going to waste six months a year and then none of us are going to, neither of us are going to be happy. Right. Yeah. And I like, I like what, what you do by telling people this isn't going to work. Um, you know, you create, kind of a scarcity mentality that makes that dentist or doctor or whoever like think I really do want to work with them though. So maybe I do need to change and adapt. Um, You know, maybe what they have is exactly what I need. And so, I mean, yeah, you have a tough conversation up front, but you're right. If we go down this road together and, and you keep using your systems or lack of systems the way that you're yeah. using them, it's not, it's not going to be beneficial for either of us. And then you're going to badmouth me all throughout the world. And, you know, so I'd just rather say no to you, um, you know, but if the dentist is like, well, why'd you say no? And you say, well, you don't have any systems. You don't have a front yeah. desk person. Like, you, like this isn't going to work. You want this and we can provide this. And then that dentist really thinks about like, well, maybe I want that. Like maybe you've opened up their eyes um, and maybe they can conform to what you want. And and through that scarcity mentality of I don't have to have you as a client, um, you know, they're wanting to become a client, you know. A lot of them. Yeah, they definitely need that internal help to kind of like set the right systems, have the right conversation, build the right culture. Once you have that, then we can tack on like a really good system to drive the right patients. Uh, But a lot of them, they almost need to go through kind of like a internal boot camp to begin with and spend a year (laughs) doing that and then come back to us. And then it's like, okay, I'm I'm now ready to sort of like rev up the patient flow. And we, we are honest with them, which is like, I don't think we, we say this on dental town all the time. It's like most dentists, like the reason you're not much bigger right now is not really a lack of marketing. Sure, it could it could be a strong catalyst and it could drive sales if your business internally runs well. And how you do that? Well, you need help with building the right culture, making sure you have the right people on the team, learning how to have those tough conversations from you know people such as yourselves who have had to have these conversations. And you know, you're, I'm sure you're normalized to it. Uh, uh, you're able to teach them just how to do that. That's kind of what they need to fix first. You know, once that's going well, yes, like we can help them grow a lot. You get a lot of patience, but um, it's a waste of time to go down this path if they're not willing to admit that. It's like, maybe I need to work on myself a little bit first, right. improve the leadership, <laughs> make sure I got the right people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like I said, there's just always layers and layers of questions that are underneath everything. And uh, like you said, I got to get the right system in place. I got to get the right employees. And then, like I said, you got to decide on what kind of patient do you want? You know, are you just wanting to come and, and do bread and butter dentistry? That's totally cool. If that's what you want, if that's what you enjoy, right on, man. So we can go and reach a certain type of audience that way. But if you're wanting to do, uh, you know, more rehab cosmetic type dentistry, then that's a whole different type of marketing. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, th- that should always come in line with a lot, all the, with the conversation and the questioning and, and fact finding and onboarding. And it's just, it's all a big part of the process. So I think, 
the, the dentist should understand that, you know, this is, these are the expectations. These are the questions we're going to have to get through in order to get what you want to optimize it. And if you need to bring in somebody to help, you know, prepare your staff for it, then so be it. It's just it's while you're making month after month after month of a marketing investments, but you've made no investment in your employees and the structure and the systems that you have or don't have in place, well, your return is not going to be nearly as good. So Absolutely. Yeah. I feel like we can we can have this conversation for the next like five hours because I, yeah, I definitely I, <laughs> I, I agree with what you guys are saying. And I really like that direct approach. I think so many people sort of like figure skate around the tough conversations. And I really liked how it's like, listen, just rip the band-aid off. You have to have these tough talks. Like this is how corporate America does it, not because they're trying to be you know, mean to people. Uh, this is an efficient way to do it because you're going to find out fast whether it's worth spending time to, to train that person to be what you want them to be or whether they really don't have what it takes and they're better off going somewhere else, right? Um, so where can dentists uh, learn a bit more about you guys? I'm guessing by going to 406 Resources. Yep, head up to our uh, website, 406resources.com. Um, but obviously to have the most candid conversation uh, is just to reach out to us uh, either by email or phone and, and we could set up some time to you know have a Zoom meeting or just have a chat on the phone and just kind of, uh, you know, find out, like I said, one of those, what are, what are the goals? What kind of culture do you have? Where do you want to go? Are you prepared for that? And, um, and just kind of see what, uh, you know, their needs really are. Cause a lot of times, um, you know, I'm getting, you know, so many phone calls, but you know, my new patients really aren't booking. So our marketing's not working. Oh, are you sure it's your marketing? Your marketing guy may be doing a great job, but you know, your front desk person may be fumbling the phone call. And so all of a sudden, yeah, what they need immediately changes. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's generally, you know, how we get started, uh, you know, hit us up as the kids say, and you know, let's, let's have a chat. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. I think this was a really interesting conversation and I definitely got a lot out of it that honestly applies to my business as well. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah thank well, you I mean, so much. For, as a marketer myself, yeah, we, we're, you and I are talking on the same level and having Kelly in place to be able to, to layer in and, and just show us how that overlap really comes into play and how much it can improve a practice's performance on their marketing, um, you know, makes total sense. So no, it's been a great visit. Thanks for having us out. Thank you.